But I did want to ask you about another issue that has been noticed with the Democratic Party uh, taking, you know, becoming just as much an enemy of left and, you know, uh, popular uh, working class policy as the right. You know, Patrick Wilson of the Richmond Post-Dispatch, uh, who covered your campaign in depth in 2017, observed uh, that people like the Democratic Par people in the Democratic Party would have preferred uh, that he not cover you at all and frankly prefer that you lose, saying, quote, the party, like the Republicans in Virginia, are so closely tied to the big monopoly uh, that Carter stood against um, that they would have rather see you be defeated. Uh, could you talk about, one, uh, your fight against big energy and your belief in antitrust uh, laws and uh, breaking up the big monopolies and also just, uh, you know, what it's like running against two parties at once? Yeah, I mean, I, I really have been running against two parties at once uh, for my entire time in the House. Um, you know, in my first term, I actually, uh, I, I voted against uh, the multi-billion dollar Amazon deal. Uh, I, I voted against a similarly corrupt deal to give $70 million to Micron, the semiconductor manufacturer in my home district. Um, you know, I was intentionally excluded by both parties from all the negotiations around that because they knew that I would object. Um, and then they ended up actually having a Republican from six hours away put in the bill to give $70 million to this company that wanted to expand their factory in my district. Um, so, you know, there's, there's this bipartisan economic consensus uh, around trickle down economics, but we've seen, and we've been trying this for 50 years and it's never worked. Uh, so, you know, when, when someone comes in and talks about busting up monopolies, uh, putting economic power in the hands of working people, uh, when we talk about how economic development really should function to serve the people rather than serving corporate interests, it gets a backlash from both major parties. And so, um, you know, my, my local Democratic committee was helpful, but the Democratic Party of Virginia as a whole um, sort of likes to pretend that I don't exist. You know, the, they'll do kind of the bare minimum to say, oh, yeah, we helped him. But, you know, you look at you look at the amount of money they spend in my race versus a neighboring district and, you know, they'll spend four five, six times as much money in the neighboring district, even though that race is not as close. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's because, you know, they, they have to keep up appearances that we're all on one team, but at the end of the day, their lives are going to be a lot easier when they're talking to their donors. If I'm no longer a factor. Well, that's funny that you, um, you know, have avoided or they've been able to kind of just ignore you up until this point. But now that you're literally running for governor, um, you know, they're going to have to confront. They're going to have to give you the gonna, Upton Sinclair treatment. Yeah, the Upton Sinclair <laughs> treatment. Exactly. Um, and if you and you've pledged to, you know, only accept small dollar donations in this race, race, which is super admirable and something that, uh, you know, we wish that all politicians would uh, pledge. However, that's not the case. And I'm guessing that your opponents in this race will not only uh, you know, not be following such principles when it comes to campaign finance. But I imagine that the Virginia Democratic Party, as you referenced, is probably already in the process of finding the perfect milk toast candidate to prop up with big money, someone who's probably not a socialist. And I'm just wondering what your strategy is to overcome that, you know, big money gap that you're going to be up against, and also how you're going to force the media to cover your candidacy, because often it seems like uh, when it comes to successful leftist candidates, um, they really understand that ability to force the media coverage, to force the conversation in their direction, rather than just allowing themselves to be sidelined by the establishment. Yeah, um, you know, I've, I've never taken a single dime from for-profit uh, for -profit corporations or industry interest groups. Um, you know, I had a, a, a few, you know, in my first campaign that tried and I returned the checks with a very polite you know, thank you, but I only accept contributions from individuals. Uh, but Virginia has no limits whatsoever on campaign contributions, right? Mm -hmm. The only restriction is you have to be an American citizen, a green card holder, or a corporation from somewhere in America, huh. right? Those are the only limits. Um, and so, you know, we had in, in 2019, there, there's a, a, a Republican who uh, got a half a million dollar check from a casino owner in Illinois, a single check for a half a million dollars. And that was perfectly legal, completely fine. Um, and that was for a house race. And there's a hundred house seats in Virginia. So when we're talking about a statewide race, you know, we're talking about how Ralph Northam raised like $31 million, right? For um, a state race? Yeah, for a state race. 
Um, and, you know, in this primary, I'm running against a multimillionaire who is very closely connected with the Clinton family and three lawyers. And so they're going to have a lot of big institutional money. And the only way that we overcome that is with thousands and thousands of people uh, kicking in and, and, and helping out where they can. Um, because, you know, there, there is uh, a desire for a different kind of politics in every state. But um, we haven't been able to, to actually break through and, and, and reach people and convince them that uh, there is a better way forward.